The Progressive Magazine started in 1909, and it was the project of a progressive politician by the name of Robert M. La Follette and his wife, Belle Case La Follette, who was a, an activist for uh, women's rights and uh, anti-racism in the early 20th century. And the two of them produced a magazine that was originally called La Follette's Weekly, and later it was called La Follette's Magazine, and then eventually the Progressive Magazine. And the idea was to have a voice, a mouthpiece, if you will, for the ideas of the progressive movement of the early 20th century, which was all about getting corporate power, corporate control out of our governing system. It was about supporting everyday working people. It was about supporting the rights of women to vote, the rights of racial equality. And it was fiercely anti-militarist. So Bob La Follette was a senator in the U.S. Senate, and he opposed entry into World War I in 1917. And he was harshly criticized for that by all the people who wanted us to go into World War I, which included, of course, a lot of uh, weapons manufacturers and uh, other people who would get rich off of that war. And he was... Uh, basically almost chased out of the Senate. They tried to expel him from the Senate for voting against entering the war. But the magazine continued. He ran for president in 1924, and then he actually died in 1925. But the magazine continued on and still continues on to this day. And as you saw in some of those pictures of different covers, we've uh, been very involved in uh, Covering, the, covering and supporting the civil rights movement in the 1960s, the anti-Vietnam War movement of the 1960s and 70s, and many of the solidarity movements with Latin America in the 1970s and 80s, opposition to the first war in Iraq in 1991, and again to the second war in Iraq in 2003, and opposing the U.S. Uh, war in Afghanistan. We also had a famous court case where we had a writer who discovered the secret of how the hydrogen bomb was made. And we published that in the magazine and it became a national uh, court case because the government tried to stop us from publishing it and it went on for six months or so. But the idea was not to show people how to build a hydrogen bomb. The idea was to show people that all of the government's regimen of secrecy around nuclear weapons, which was really a foundation of the Cold War and a lot of the repression of uh, people in the 1950s and 60s, that all of that was false. Because you could go into a library and you could find the information you needed to come up with the secret of how the H-bomb was made. So that was a, a very important case in the late 1970s. Um, in the 80s, uh, we were one of the first publications to expose the US funding of the death squads in El Salvador. We were one of the first publications to uh, investigate the death of uh, Mexican journalist Manuel Buendia. Uh, over the years, we've uh, exposed ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council that uh, helps uh, right-wing groups pass legislation in state legislatures around the country, the origin of uh, many of these laws, like the Stand Your Ground law that resulted in the murder of Trayvon Martin, uh, and also, of course, the opposition now to uh, voting rights and the creation of voter ID laws. We've also been very active in uh, covering the attempts to privatize our public school system over the past, uh, what, about uh, almost 10 years. We've been running a project uh, called, it's now called Public Schools Advocate. And what we do is we have teachers and community activists writing about public schools and the efforts that are going on around the country to privatize our public schools. So those are some of the kinds of things that we cover in the progressive. I know that you folks are discussing independent media in general. So I'll talk a little bit about my own role in some of that. Um, I've been involved in independent media for four decades or more now and uh, working with the independent media centers, which grew up in the 
1990s and uh, early 2000s, working with community radio, both here in the United States and around the world as a, uh, as a means of giving everyday people a voice on the airwaves. Uh, and then now for the last six or seven years here at the Progressive Magazine. So that's, uh, that's a little bit of my background. I think that, um, you know, nowadays, a lot of people get their media from uh, Facebook. And so I think it's worth talking a little bit about the difference between independent media and Facebook. Facebook is something that takes the work of other journalists and puts it up there and makes money off of it by putting advertising around the edges of it. And so that's a very different model. The model of the independent media centers, uh, the website indiemedia.org, which you can still see on the, uh, on the internet. Um, the idea was to get everyday people telling the stories about what was going on in their community or in their movement or in their organization. And so it was a matter of training people, giving people the skills and the techniques and the technologies to be able to make their own media and tell their own stories. Nowadays, a lot of the uh, mainstream media companies use these things. They call it, you know, so they say citizen journalism, and they use cell phone video on their uh, on their news reports. But in fact, all of that started with this idea of the indie media centers of empowering everyday people to be able to make their own media rather than being subject to the corporately controlled media, which is what the main networks and cable uh, television stations represented. One of the examples I use of that is the Indie Media Center covering the WTO protests in Seattle in 1999. And in a piece that I wrote a number of years ago now, I talk about the fact that on November 30th, 1999, the Indie Media Center website actually got more hits than CNN. And the reason was that these larger media companies were taking the press releases from the mayor's office and their mayor's office was saying, we're not using rubber bullets in the streets of Seattle. And the Indie Media reporters, young people who had maybe been given a portable recorder or a portable video recorder or a portable tape recorder for the first time, were going out into the streets collecting handfuls of rubber bullets, videotaping them and putting it out on the internet and sending it around the world. And that's the kind of thing that independent media can do. Corporate media always reports from the top down, the press releases coming from the office of this official or that department. And indie media goes to the bottom and looks up tells the stories of people on the ground who are being affected by the policies, by the actions of these corporate actors. And we're seeing that now in some of the coverage coming out of the war in Ukraine, where everyday independent reporters are able to get their stories out through the internet so that you have a real image of what's actually going on and you don't have to listen to one side or the other that's using the press releases as a form of war propaganda. You have actual stories from the people that are being affected by the bombs, by the uh, invasion that's going on right now. So those are some of the kinds of things that are the basic principles, I think, of, of indie media is giving voice to the unrepresented or underrepresented sectors of our society and giving everyday people the power to create their own stories, their own media about what's happening to them and to their communities. Um, one other thing I should touch on is just some of the effects of this sort of journalism. And I think if you look throughout the history of the United States, you see that it was this sort of independent reporting that created most of the change that we see. In the early 20th century, it was the photographers who went in and took <clears throat> pictures of the children working in factories that created the child labor laws that we have in this country today. In the uh, times of the Vietnam War, the journalists who went on their own 
to report back about what was going on that really showed the lie of the US government when they were saying, oh, we're winning in Vietnam, we'll be, we'll be done with this war any day now. And in fact, what they were seeing was the United States from the very beginning was not only not winning, but was actually making the war worse for the everyday people that we supposedly were, were there to protect. Uh, similarly, in the civil rights movement, it was independent journalists who went and showed what was going on in the streets of Birmingham with fire hoses being turned on people with the uh, famous march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. It was those pictures getting shared across the country on what was then uh, the only avenues, which was uh, commercial television or the front page of large newspapers. But those stories taken very often by freelancers, independent journalists who were out there on their own, who were then selling their work to, to try and pay the bills. And they were reporting on the ground on these stories. And that's what resulted in the changes in federal legislation. It was the pressure of uh, the people getting uh, beaten in Selma, Alabama, that was on the front page of papers like the New York Times and the Washington Post. It was that pressure that caused the Johnson administration to push forward the Voting Rights Act. So this kind of independent journalism is in fact what does create change in this country. It shows, it shines a light on what the powerful would rather have happen behind closed doors or in, in the shadows. And it brings the stories of people to a national audience so that folks really understand what's happening in an area, in a community, in a struggle. So that's, that's a little bit of uh, what we do at The Progressive. We try to uh, bring those voices into the pages of our magazine, the website, and these various projects that we do, including the Public Schools Advocate. And we also do a project to get op-eds in newspapers across the country. So we get writers to write op-eds and then we distribute them all around the country and they get uh, thousands of readers in small towns, large cities, but it gives these voices, particularly voices that are otherwise unrepresented, um, people of color, um, LGBTQ writers, uh, people from various uh, environmental organizations, people from uh, social change organizations and so on, giving those people a voice in media outlets across the country. So those are some of the things that we do at The Progressive. We've been doing it, as I said, for about 113 years now, and uh, we hope to continue doing it for uh, a long time to come.